other ladies. I'm here to fill your heads with more useful information for managing your menopause your way. You probably never imagined that there could be so much to menopause, but now that you're a student of Menopause University, you're becoming quite an expert on how to manage in the world of menopause. We're getting near the end of our unit on heart attacks, and closely related to heart attacks are blood clots. I like to address all your concerns, and many women have concerns or questions about blood clots. So that's our topic for today. In the book, this material is in chapter 28, regardless of whether you have the first edition or the second edition. It's just a tiny section in the book, but it'll be much more elaborate here in this video. You may wonder why you should watch this video when you can just read the book. Well, there's no way to do in a book what I can do in a video. Here, I can show you props, demonstrate things, and really make it fun for you. So even if you have my book, watch this and all the other videos. You'll love the way they complement one another. And the book will serve as a reference forever. So, blood clots. First, let me say that your blood is supposed to clot. Normal blood clotting is an essential part of the healing process of any injury. If it didn't clot, you would bleed to death with just a simple little cut in your skin. So blood clotting is a good thing overall. We're not talking about the normal blood clotting process today. We're talking about abnormal blood clots. What we're really talking about is when your blood clots at the wrong time or in the wrong place. We're addressing blood clots that are larger than desired and blood clots that harm you rather than help you. There are many ter terms for blood clots and while they may have some slight differences, for purposes of menopause, they all imply the same thing. They all represent the phenomenon of something blocking a blood vessel so that blood and oxygen cannot flow to the parts that are beyond the blockage. So if this is a blood vessel, this red thing in the inside is a blood clot. In the videos on heart attack, we were talking about a blockage in an artery. And in video 182 on stroke, we were also talking about a blockage in an artery. With blood clots, we're usually talking about a blockage in a vein. And generally speaking, the difference between the two is pretty simple. Arteries carry blood to an organ. Veins carry blood away from an organ. With regard to the many different terms for blood clots, some are very specific as to the cause of the location of blood clots, and others are more general, but they all refer to the same general idea of a blocked vein. You may have heard of any of the following terms to imply this phenomenon. Thrombus, embolus, venous thromboembolism, or VTE, deep venous thrombosis, DVT, or pulmonary embolus, PE. I give you the full names even though you live in a world where acronyms have largely taken the place of full names. I'm always shocked when I see a TV commercial that uses acronyms only and never tells you the full name for what they're advertising. Back in the olden days, we learned that you never, ever, ever use an acronym without defining it first. And to this day, I simply cannot use an acronym without defining it first. I should have been an English teacher. <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is tell you the individual meanings of each of those terms. First, we'll start with a thrombus. A thrombus is a blood clot that consists of both blood and fibrous material. Now, thrombus formation is actually a normal event. It is the normal response to injury in order to prevent bleeding. Like I said earlier, your blood is supposed to clot. If it didn't clot, you just bleed all the time. Every time you had any kind of injury, you would just bleed to death. But instead, when you cut your skin, it does bleed, but eventually it stops bleeding. And the reason it stops bleeding is because a thrombus forms. A thrombus is problematic when it clogs your vein. 
And just like the blockage in an artery to your heart or brain, the tissue beyond the clot dies because it gets no blood or oxygen. It backs up the blood. An embolus is a blood clot that breaks off and travels from where it formed to a distant site, where there it blocks the blood of the flow of blood and oxygen. So a thrombus is stationary, but an embolus travels. Next is venous thromboembolism, or VTE. A venous thromboembolism is the same thing as a thrombus and an embolus. It's a blood clot in your vein that travels to a distant site and blocks blood flow. And it's actually a collective term for two different forms of thrombosis. There's deep venous thrombosis, or DVT, and there's pulmonary embolus, PE. A deep venous thrombosis is, in the forma is the formation of a blood clot in one of the deep veins in your body, like your leg or your pelvis. A pulmonary embolus is the blockage of your pulmonary artery or one of its branches. It's a blood clot that forms in one location, breaks off, and travels to the arteries of your lungs. So all these terms are variations of the same phenomenon. Blood clots are just a ball of blood blocking a vein. Now sometimes people get all caught up in the minutia of one of these without realizing that they all basically imply the same thing. I'm going to use the term blood clot throughout this video for all of them. So now we're ready to talk about the risk factors for blood clots. Remember the risk factors for a heart attack? It was that big, long list that I've shown you about 30 times. <laughs> Do you know what the risk factors are for blood clots? Take a look at this quiz question. Which of the following are risk factors for a blood clot? A, surgery. B, genetic predisposition. C, immobility. D, obesity. E, birth control pills. F, cancer. G, pregnancy. H, long distance travel. I, a previous blood clot. J, HRT for menopause. K, all of the above. L is A, C, and G above. M is E and I above. And N is D, E, H, and I above. What did you pick? Now, are you sure of your answer or are you just guessing? Can you detect any patterns or commonalities in some of the options? Here's the question again with the answer in bold. It's all of the above. They are all risk factors for a blood clot. And now I'll discuss, discuss them, but I'm going to group them somewhat in order to reveal the patterns. First is your genetics. Some people have a genetic mutation that puts them at high risk for a blood clot. Fortunately, most people who have a mutation know they've got the mutation and they know what it means for them personally. Most other people have never even heard of these genetic mutations. Here are some of the names. Factor V polymorphisms, prothrombin G20210A mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, and protein C or protein S deficiency. If you've made it to your postmenopausal phase of life and have never received a diagnosis of a genetic mutation that causes a blood clot, then don't worry about it. <laughs> you would have known about it long before now. <laughs> In the same general category is the risk factor of a history of a blood clot. If you yourself have had a blood clot before, then you're at risk for another one. His the history does have a tendency to repeat itself. What you do not see on this list is a family history of blood clots. And that's because unless you have a heritable genetic mutation, your family's blood clots usually have nothing to do with you. Okay, next, 
I'm going to group all of the following. Surgery, cancer, immobility, obesity, and long distance travel. Now, if you're looking at that list thinking, what? They have nothing in common. Think again. The key to all of them is immobility. When you have surgery, you're immobile during your recovery. When you have cancer, you're immobile if you have surgery or if you're just depressed. If you're obese, you're probably very sedentary. When you travel long distances, you're immobile for many hours at a time. So the key is immobility. In medical parlance, we use the word stasis. And it means that when you're immobile, your blood flow gets sluggish. So when you're sluggish, your blood flow is also sluggish. And sluggish blood flow clots more. So anything that limits your mobility, either permanently or temporarily, puts you at higher risk for blood clots. And the last category consists of pregnancy, birth control pills, and HRT for menopause. So this category is all about hormones. All sex hormones are associated with an increased risk of blood clots. And the higher the dosage, the higher the risk. So guess which of the three items in this category carries the highest risk? Your choices are between pregnancy, birth control pills, and HRT for menopause. It's pregnancy. By far, it's pregnancy. But you're young and spry and mobile and healthy when you get pregnant, so you don't give blood clots nary a thought at all. But the levels of both estrogen and progesterone are sky high during pregnancy, higher than at any other time in your life. And you've already learned from me in many of these videos that hormonal birth control contains much higher dosages of estrogen and progesterone than does HRT for menopause. So birth control is the second highest risk for in the hormone category. They increase your risk by two to four times. But again, unless you're obese or you're a smoker, you probably gave nary a thought to blood clots when you were using birth control either. The dosages of estrogen and progesterone in HRT are minuscule, even if you take the minimal necessary dosage to, to prevent a heart attack. So they pose the lowest risk in this category. But now that you're older and you value your health and your friends scare you to death about HRT and blood clots, your concern about blood clots becomes more significant. And the longer you take HRT, the greater your risk. But be careful. People tend to hear something like that and then ascribe all the risk to that one thing. But there's more to it than that. There is one thing that increases your risk of blood clots more than anything, no matter what else is going on. It's age. The older you get, the greater your risk. Of course, the older you get, the more health problems you have and the more sedentary you become, and the longer you remain immobile if you have surgery, etc., etc. So be sure to consider the whole picture. Don't put all the blame on one thing. Rarely is a blood clot due to just one thing. Now, I have talked to you about the Women's Health Initiative, or WHI, results with regard to heart attack and stroke, and I want to do the same thing for blood clots. The findings for blood clots were the pivotal finding that sent people scrambling. When I tell women the real results, they usually just can't believe them and they feel so deceived. But I think it helps to know the facts and to understand what really happened in that study. Without going into detail about all the other diseases that that study addressed, here's what the findings were for blood clots. As you know, the study was done to determine if HRT was useful for preventing blood clots. But instead, the reported result was that HRT caused blood clots. And I taught you in video 178 that you can't switch from, per, from prevention to cause in a research study, but that's precisely what they did in the WHI. And the exact wording of the media's report to you, the public, was this. 
There was a 100% increased risk of blood clots in women taking HRT. 100% increased risk. What does a 100% increased risk mean to you? See if you can answer this quiz question. The WHI's report that HRT increases the risk of a blood clot by 100% means A. Every woman who takes HRT is at high risk for a blood clot. In other words, the 100% refers to 100% of people. B. No matter what one does to decrease her risk of a blood clot, the risk of a blood clot outweighs all other factors. In other words, 100% refers to certainty. C. For each woman who takes HRT, her individual risk of a blood clot increases 100%. In other words, 100% refers to degree of risk. D. In the study group, which represents the general population, 100% more women had a blood clot with HRT than without HRT. In other words, the 100% refers to population statistics. E. A blood clot will occur 100% of the time in individuals who continue to use HRT. In other words, the 100% refers to frequency. Or is it F, which is A and B above, G, which is B and C above, or H, none of the above? Not so easy, is it? Do you see how different those options are? Well, here it is again with the answer in bold. It's D. In the study group, which represents the general population, 100% more women had a blood clot with HRT than without HRT. So the 100% refers to population statistics. The key is to understand that statistics are always about the entire population. And when you hear the statistics of a study, they're always about the study population. They are never about you personally. So in the WHI study, the 100% increased risk meant that instead of eight women per 10,000 per year having a blood clot, 16 women out of 10,000 per year had a blood clot. In other words, without HRT, of the 10,000 women in the study, eight had a blood clot. And with HRT, of the 10,000 women in the study, 16 had a blood clot. Eight to 16, that is a 100% increase. But are you as bothered by the eight to 16 as you were about the 100% increase? 8 to 16, that doesn't sound like a big deal, does it? But 100% increase does. So that's why everyone freaked out. Okay, so HRT does increase your risk of a blood clot to some degree, but it's a slight increase. Nevertheless, it helps to know which HRT options increase it the most and which increase it the least. So I'll address estrogen and progesterone separately. They both increase your risk of a blood clot but different forms of each do so to different degrees. With regard to estrogen, it's really simple. Any estrogen product you take by mouth increases your risk of blood clots more than the forms you do not take by mouth. It's really that simple, and here's why. Estrogen that you take by mouth has to go through your digestive tract, and your digestive tract includes your liver. And when estrogen gets degraded in your liver, it increases your risk of blood clots. So all the estrogen skin patches, skin gels, skin sprays, 
lotions, implanted pellets, vaginal rings, and vaginal creams have a lower risk of blood clots than estrogen pills that you take by mouth. And any form of estrogen that confines its action to your vagina and only treats your vaginal symptoms has no risk of blood clots at all. For estrogen to have any risk of causing a blood clot, it has to be one of the estrogens that travels throughout your body. I just presented all of them in video 177 on the hormonal options for preventing a heart attack. I even made a chart for you. So if you haven't watched that video, tisk, tisk. You gotta watch them in order. And when it comes to progesterone, it's really simple too. Bio-identical progesterone presents a lower risk of causing blood clots than non-bio-identical progesterone. It doesn't matter at all whether the progesterone is made by a compounding pharmacy or a pharmaceutical company. That's irrelevant. I've explained that to you many times. Bioidentical progesterone is identical to the progesterone in your own body. Well, the progesterone your body used to produce, and we call it progesterone. Non-bioidentical progesterone is synthetic progesterone that is not identical to the progesterone your body used to produce, and we call it progestin. So once again, you see that HRT has both benefits and risks. It decreases your risk of a heart attack and stroke, and it may slightly increase your risk of a blood clot. Benefit versus risk. That's what menopause management is all about. That's why you have to tailor everything to your personal circumstance. So if you want to decrease your risk for a blood clot, avoid immobility, choose HRT options that suit your risk profile, or skip HRT if the risks are greater than the benefits. You know that I'm available for one-on-one -on -one consultations on this or anything else that you want to address. So go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule one anytime. And also follow me and subscribe. And in the next video, I will discuss the all-important and very common matter of high blood pressure as it pertains to heart attack. So I will see you then. <laughs> Bye.